Dysentery, as I mentioned uh, last week, uh, or at least earlier this week, um, is terribly um, destructive of human beings. It clogs up the hospitals in the third world, it makes travellers ill, it makes... It is the main reason why infants die, as you know, um, more than 50% of infant mortality in developing countries is caused by dysentery because it's passed on from parents to children, uh, or in other ways, the infants get dysentery, amoebic and bacillary dysentery, the two forms, particularly bacillary, and they evacuate stools, they dehydrate, and they die of dehydration. This is why oral rehydration therapy, which is basically giving infants lots of um, drink, particularly drink which has sugar and um, some kind of lemon or orange in it and purified water obviously. That made a tr tremendous transformation in the third world. It's probably one of the great inventions or a rehydration therapy. Because if you rehydrate these infants they don't die. It's, they die of dehydration from dysentery. So it's a terribly important disease to understand. Um, so, what, what causes, where would you look for the causes of dysentery? Well, it's, it's, it's quite a simple chain. Basically, you, you get dysentery through your mouth. Either the bacillus or the amoeba, the two forms of dysentery, come in through your mouth. So if you go back through that chain, how do you, does it come in? It comes in in two main ways. Well, it comes in through drink and food, basically. Um, and therefore you have to look at the chains of drink and food and particularly the contamination of food and drink through the disposal of human feces. As I mentioned uh, last lecture, the, the, this is a terribly important, much understudied area of human behaviour, the way you treat feces, which is related to a lot in anthropology, purity and danger and the contamination and the good and the bad and taboo and so on and so on. So it's an area which um, Mary Douglas and other anthropologists have a lot to throw light on. Um, disgust and um, so on is, is central to this. Now, there are two places which managed to solve the problem of dysentery relatively early. One of them, again, was Japan. Um, when I started to study Japanese demography, I was amazed, as others were, to find that dysentery is not, hasn't been an important cause of either infant or adult mortality for the last 300 years. The greatest city on earth, Tokyo, in the 18th century, and at times in the 19th century, Osaka, Kyoto and others, um, over a million people. There was no serious outbreaks of dysentery, and then this other many other great cities of Japan, this country was not a serious problem. And one of the reasons for this, as I learnt from the man I mentioned last time, Edward Morse, in his pioneering articles, Latrines East and West, and in his great notes, two volume work, um, uh, tour through Japan, he noticed as a biologist, he was particularly interested in the way of um, feces disposal in Japan. Basically, Japan had the problem of what to do with its refertilizing its rice fields more seriously than anywhere else in the world. There's very, the soil is very thin, a lot of it volcanic ash and poor, and there is not much of it. The whole Japanese population uh, historically, which has been quite high, 20 million by 1800, lives in an area the size of a small English county, Kent or Middlesex or something like that, very small area of Cambridgeshire. That's all the decent land there is in Japan, the rest is mountains. And it's not good land, even grass doesn't grow very well on it. There were a few domestic animals, as I mentioned, for fertilizer, less and less of them over time. And the fertilizers that were used, which are seaweed and fish, um, were limited. So there was a huge need for fertilizer, and what they used was night soil or human feces and urine, which was taken out of the cities, carried out on people's shoulders or along in barges, and 
put into huge vats where many of the dangerous bacteria and so on died. They die in that process and they die when it's put on the field. So basically you kill any forms of dysentery. You don't kill the things that cause um, some other diseases like schistosomiasis, but you do kill dysentery by the process that they elaborated. So feces and um, urine were carefully husbanded. Japanese toilets were in the whole immaculate, the best in the world. They invented toilet paper, probably. Certainly they used it very extensively from the 15th, 16th centuries onwards. Um, they separated out the, the urine and the feces to use them in different ways. And it was valued beyond gold. You could buy it for gold or silver. For instance, again, a sort of nice little anecdote which will stick it in your mind. If you were a student in studying at the equivalent of Cambridge University, say at a, a university or at least an institution in Osaka in the 18th, 19th centuries, if you were a student and you took a room, then you would pay the landlord some rent. If there were two of you, or three of you, you wouldn't pay the landlord any rent. If there were six of you, he would pay you for being there because you were producing so much valuable feces and urine that he could sell it and so he owed you some of the profit. In the, on the Tokaido, the great highway from Tokyo to Kyoto, um, along the Tokaido, and you still see this in China actually, I noticed it recently in China, but um, the houses built onto the highway would, in the front of the houses, there would be a slit and people travelling along, if they wanted to urinate, would urinate into the, through the slit and the people in the house would collect their urine. There are stories told in the late 19th century of um, very uh, mean people who were used to go out to dinner um, at their neighbour's house and if they felt the impulsion to go to the loo, they would leave the dinner table, rush back to their own toilet and defecate there and then come back to dinner. They were too mean to give it to their neighbours. So, to, um, urine and feces were very carefully controlled and therefore it didn't contaminate and get into the water system. And this was one of the great reasons for the absence of dysentery and um, typhoid to a large extent. England took the absolute the opposite solution. The population pressure was here was much less. There were many animals and so um, animal manure was what fertilized the fields. There was hardly any use except in some vegetable gardens. There's, a, there's an interesting kind of what you might call the, the feces line which no one has investigated, subject for one of you to look at, that runs roughly China, Japan, Vietnam, all that is on the size of heavy use of animal, of human feces on the fields. To the west, it's abhorrent. India, much of Nepal, Europe, on the whole, don't use human manure. So it's an interesting, it's to do also with the keeping of animals. There are little pockets, for instance, the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal until recently. The veg they didn't have any large animals in the Kathmandu Valley. Um, they used human feces from the city. Or again, the Dutch cities in the 17th century. Um, they had very intensive agriculture, no, not many animals, and human feces were shipped out. But on the whole, it's absent. What, what the English did was they took a different approach they concentrated on trying to dispose of their human feces efficiently. As you probably know, the greatest British invention, perhaps, of all time is the water closet. Sir John Harrington, and indeed there are medieval water closets. The idea that you flush these things away from the house using water, invented and reinvented several times, had become um, quite widespread by the 18th century. The use of privies, uh, earth closets, was widespread. The British basically rejected their feces but got rid of them moderately safely and then 
Chadwick in the middle of the 19th century put it onto a proper drainage system. Um, but the water closet doesn't really explain the English case. I think um, the Japanese case is, is fairly simple. They just didn't contaminate the water supplies. But there was no great development in water closets in the 18th century. It spread a bit. So what could be the explanation for the decline of dysentery? Because one of the things Malthus noticed, and others who studied the English demography in the early part of the 19th century, was that the great transformation in the death rate, the drop in infant and adult mortality in the 18th century in England, which made the modern world possible, it made great cities like London possible, and the Industrial Revolution possible. That somehow was linked to the fact that Malthus noticed, which was the huge decline in dysentery. From about 1740, the rates of dysentery declined. And it declined um, not just for adults, but also, as I mentioned, for children and infants. This turns one's attention to what people are drinking. And that's what McEwen left out. He looked at food, but he didn't look at drink. Now, drink is much more important in terms of disease than food. We drink much more than we eat, and um, drink can be much more contaminated than food. So if you're going to study some of these diseases, you have to look at drink. So what did um, these two nations drink? Because this is the other part of the solution to Japan. The Japanese drink, didn't drink milk which is very dangerous until pasteurization. To drink milk was to kill yourself. It was uh, just a, a swarm of bacteria. Milk is a, an ideal place for bacteria to assemble um, before it was boiled and pasteurized. And the Japanese never drank animal milk. They thought of it as a kind of blood and um, disgusting. But anyway, they didn't have milking animals until quite recently. And they also suffered from lactose intolerance, as you because of this, if you don't drink, if an infant doesn't drink milk for about a year or two, uh, animal milk, it becomes intolerant to the enzymes in milk and will be sick. Modern Japanese school children are all given free milk and um, so you know, they eat butter and milk products happily, but until 50, 50 years ago, ja Japanese couldn't stomach, literally, stomach milk. They didn't drink it. Um, so what did they drink? Well, they drank um, things like sake, which is distilled rice, but it's too alcoholic and expensive for most people to drink, and you can't drink much of it each day if you're going to do anything else. So they, and they would not drink water. They knew it was dangerous. They wouldn't drink it. So what did they drink? Well, from about the 13th, 14th century, they drank tea. And they now, if you go to give a lecture in a Japanese lecture room, if you're lucky, and probably you'll be given a pot of tea to drink through the lecture, as I'm doing here. Um, tea, 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 all through the day in Japanese agriculture. Now, it has other effects, of course. It strengthens, loosens the muscle, improves the memory, all the things I may have mentioned last term in my other lectures. But apart from those sorts of effects, making you much more efficient in other respects, it also, um, because it's boiled, and for another reason, it stops you getting waterborne disease. This was noticed early on by a, a Japanese um, Zen Buddhist priest, Isai, E-I-S-A-I. -I. It was he who gave me the clue to the secret, I think, of the dramatic transformation in dysentery. Because in a 13th century text on the medical properties of tea in two volumes, he said that tea does some strange thing to the stomach. It has a bitter substance in it which stops stomach illnesses. He didn't know what it was, but he knew it was there. And so later on, um, I investigated that. So the Japanese were drinking tea, and I think this is the other great reason why they had very little waterborne disease. In England, again, they, they share the characteristic of not liking to drink water. On the whole, the British most of their history have refused to drink cold, unboiled water. 
There was something they joked about the French doing and the Italians doing. They were too poor to drink anything else in those countries. But in England, you avoided water. And early on, you replaced it with mild alcoholic drinks, with ale, and then with beer. A great transformation is with beer, because in the late 15th century, early 16th century, a new kind of drink was made with hops, beer, which changes it from ale, uh, which doesn't have the hops in. It's no coincidence that this, the most important discovery in modern medicine was done as a result of a PhD on beer. Do you know who that was? Pasteur. Pasteur's PhD thesis was on the medical property of hops. Hops, had, as the German, uh, Germans realized 2,000 years ago, seems to kill off bacteria. What Pasteur was interested in is why doesn't hops, why doesn't beer ferment quickly? You know, this thick substance should go bad very, very quickly. So he did his famous experiments on beer uh, and discovered that the hops have an antibacterial substance in them which kills bacteria. Um, and so the British, who were great beer drinkers, and on average, an Englishman in the 17th century would drink two or three pint, two or three pints of beer a day. This is small beer, very weak, but it was just universal. Children, infants, I mean a three-year, four-year-old child would be given beer. They wouldn't drink water, they'd drink beer and um, be protected against waterborne diseases. Then in the late 17th century, a, a new tax was brought in on malt and the price of beer went shooting up and people were forced to start drinking water and there was a surge in the population uh, in the mortality rates in the early 18th century. And then you got the gin craze which was an alternative to beer. So I won't um, draw a graph, You'll, you can imagine it. The mortality rate in England started to go up. It had been quite low from waterborne disease. It started to go up in the early part of the 18th century. Then, around 1730, 1740, suddenly it drops rapidly and people stop dying of waterborne diseases. Now, there is no known explanation for this. Uh, all other causes have been eliminated. So what happened in between 1720 and 1750? What happened was that the, the direct pipa trade, i.e. ship sailing directly to China, opened up. The price of tea um, dropped immensely and the British became great tea drinkers. By 1760, every person in England, more or less, and Scotland, the rich, the poor, almost everyone was drinking tea. And it, even as I discovered later, after I first discovered this, protected the infants because the mothers were drinking tea and the antibacterial substance, which is now known to exist in tea, went through the mother's milk and protected the infants as well. The discovery that tea has um, various um, substances which kill bacteria was made a long time ago. Um, in 1923, for example, a ger an American army doctor, Major McNaught, showed that the typhoid germ in pure culture becomes greatly diminished in numbers by an excursion exposure of four hours to tea. After 12, 20 hours, it was impossible to recover it at all from cold tea. They did experiments. It's the, boi the boiling of the water is helpful, but it's the tea, because if you do an experiment with cold tea, cold water, and drop typhoid, cholera, and dysentery into these, it will be killed off in the cold tea. For instance, a medical report um, by Stagg and Millen, um, it's all on my website, this stuff, if you're interested, report that in relation to the tests, infusions of green tea were found to act bacteriostatically, that kills bacteria, in vitro, in typhoid, bacillus, Shigella paradysentery, Shigella dysentery, Staphylococcus aureus, Salmonella typhosa, Vibrio cholera. Those are all different words for cholera, typhoid, and dysentery. Kills them all. So this stuff transformed the world. 
sometimes I get feedback saying, why did you go on about tea so much? Um, you may feel I went on too much and I should have got on to war, but I really do think it's terribly important. Um, and if you are ever going to travel anywhere, make sure you take plenty of tea. So we'll get on to famine next week, and thank you very much for coming to my lecture. Thank you.